Gracious Heavenly Father, we continue to be amazed at your love, your perseverance, your patience, your great mercy. And we ask, Lord, that as we come to you this evening, you will give us the willingness to listen carefully, to listen with ears that not only hear, but are willing to follow. We pray for those that will be joining us yet. Give us also memories that are able to remember and grant us that our hearts will be subjected to you, that nothing in our minds or in our surroundings will be such a noise that will take away the focus that only you and your word should have right now. Be with those that will be joining us. Be with us also. Be also with those that will be watching the video later on. Give them also of your Holy Spirit that they will be able to understand, assimilate, and practice the truths that you have for us in these days. We thank you and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, tonight we're going to be reviewing the second part of the memory verses. So that is beginning with 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Very good. 1 Corinthians 15.26, good news. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Wonderful news. It will come to an end. Habakkuk 2.4, behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yes. Exodus 12, 13, about the 10th plague and what God explained that will do and how they would uh, prepare for it. And the blood shall be to you for a token or a sign or a proof, right? Upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Exodus 20, 28 to 11, the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, Thou shalt not do any work, thou, not thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or sanctified it. Very good. Romans 5, 20 and 21 echoes from the last seminar, partly anyway, talks about the law and grace. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that a sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Every blessing, spiritual, material, and any other way comes through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? That's very evident in so many of the verses that we memorize. All right, and the very last one that we had added was Isaiah 53, 5. And it's talking about, about what Jesus did, the exchange that he made with us. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Yes. One more time on that. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes 
we are healed. Amen. Thank God for that healing that we needed and he knew exactly what it was and provided it all by himself and all on himself, right? All right, tonight we are starting chapter 33. The title of it is The Promises to Israel, The Veil and the Shadow. And it's going to be comparing how the experience that God wanted for Israel and that he wants for us is the real. But they were content with the shadow. They did not allow God to move them into the reality of the plans that he had for them. So that is what the, the gist of it, of it is. <clears throat> Later on, we will meet our new memory verse but we will not begin to to learn it until after next week all right you will meet it tonight but you don't have i mean you you are welcome to start memorizing it at any time but um this next week you will be preparing for the share and encourage session okay page 168 that's where we begin and this is quoting from second corinthians 4 three and four right at the top there let's read together but and if our gospel is veiled it is veiled in them that are perishing in whom the god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who is the image of god should not dawn upon them you're going to notice that this veil is going to be repeated over and over and it's going to also, as you see there, the second line, it says, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. That veil that we're going to be talking about and that is there in the title is a veil of unbelief where it doesn't allow you to see things clearly. It doesn't allow you to hear exactly what God is saying and how he is saying it. It's a veil that we put up, like a, a resistance to it. And so that is the symbol that is going to be used over and over to explain that. The next paragraph comes from Exodus 34, verses 30 to 35. And so we'll begin reading there as well. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses's hand. Those were the tables of the commandments, right? Tables of the testimony. When he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Parenthesis, better as the margin of the revision because he talked with him rather than saying while he talked with him a better translation would be because he talked with him capital h there for that him meaning god as a result of being in the presence of god that had also uh, impacted him and had become a light a shine a shining light in his face he didn't know it was there okay because Moses talked with God his face shone after he had left God's immediate presence quote and when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses behold the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come nigh him and Moses called unto them and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him and Moses talked with them and afterwards all the children of Israel came nigh and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai and till Moses had done speaking with them he put what a veil on his face but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him he took the veil off until he came out and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in 
to speak with him, with God. So here we have where the study that we're about to do, where it comes from. It comes from the experience of Moses speaking to God, getting all the instructions, all the um, laws and regulations for the people as a nation, civil laws, health laws, all kinds of, of laws and, and instruction. And so during that time, every time that he was going to speak to them, he had to cover his face because they were afraid of him because he had that shining light around and so he would put that face but now that that veil i'm sorry but now that veil is going to take a different connotation let's see please underline the first sentence in the next paragraph unbelief does what blinds the mind it acts as a veil, underline that too, to shut out the light. So the veil that Moses was putting on, why was he putting it on? Because he didn't want to see them? Because he didn't want to catch whatever viruses they had? No, because they could not stand to look at him like that. So he was hiding his face with that veil. Well, let's see what that really meant. Continuing on that paragraph, it is only by faith that we understand. Moses had deep and abiding faith. Therefore, he, quote, endured as seeing him who is invisible, end quote. He needed no veil over his face, even when he was in the immediate presence of the glory of God. The veil which he put on his face when he came down to talk with the children of Israel was solely on their account because his face shone so that they could not look upon him. But when he went back to talk with the Lord, he took the veil off. Next paragraph, the first two lines there, please underline them and pay close attention. The veil over the face of Moses was a concession to what? To the weakness of the people. The fault was not with Moses or with his face or with the glory that he was reflecting from whom he had been with. The problem was with the people. Okay. If he had, if he had not put it on, then each of them would have been obliged to put a veil over their, it says his own face, their own faces in order to come near to listen to Moses. So in order not to make them uncomfortable in order to accommodate them he put the veil on his face continuing they were not able as moses was to look upon the glory of the lord with unveiled faces practically therefore each one of them had a veil over his own face the face of moses was un veiled when moses talked to god he did not need to put a, a veil on him on his own face neither did he tell god Co cover it up cover it up no the face of moses was unveiled because he had faith because the the rest of the people were faithless were unbelieving that is why they needed moses to cover his face are we getting the picture here? The real reason of everything? Yes. Next paragraph, we are on page 169. <clears throat> First sentence again. Please underline. That veil over the face of the children of Israel represented what? Unbelief that was in their hearts. In other words, this was a veil of unbelief. They had a veil of unbelief, and because their veil of unbelief did not let them hear and understand and, and believe what they were listening to, they demanded or they asked Moses to cover up it, his face. Continuing now, so the veil was really over their hearts. Underline that too. The veil was really over their hearts. Their minds were blinded, and even unto this day, when Moses is read, or the books of Moses, the veil is upon their hearts. 
Isn't that terrible though? Isn't that terrible? And these things are written there so that we can know and we can say, Lord, if there is any unbelief in me, please help me to understand. And in let, instead of just covering and cowarding away from you, help me to just believe so that I can just talk to you face to face. I can understand, I can comprehend, and I can accept and take in everything you want to tell me. I don't want any veil of unbelief to keep away from me what you are trying to communicate to me. Isn't that a good prayer for us to have? Yes. Um, the last, the last sentence there begins, this is, this is true. This is true, not of the Jewish people alone, but of all who do not see Christ set forth in all the writings of Moses. Interesting, right? Because usually when people want to learn about Jesus and what he was like and what he did and all of that, well, yeah, you begin with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we should, we should be able to see Jesus in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the Deuteronomy as easily and as clearly as we are able to see, the, see him in the Gospels. And we should ask the Lord, if there is something that is not quite right, if there is any unbelief in our hearts, if it, there is any rebelliousness in us, any resisting of the Holy, to the Holy Spirit, that we would ask him, please, Lord, help me to see Jesus here. And as we have studied, right, through Genesis, uh, quite a bit of Genesis in the life of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and so forth, in Exodus, you know, the, the bringing out of, uh, the liberating of the people of Israel out of Egypt, all the wonders and beauties of God, the, the sanctuary. Have we seen Jesus? I hope we haven't missed him. I hope we haven't missed exactly what that is all about. It is Jesus, yes. All right, next paragraph. A veil interposed between people and the light. Le pardon me. A veil interposed between people and the light leaves them in the shadow. So when the children of Israel spread out the veil of unbelief, and maybe you can circle out veil of unbelief because we're going to be talking about it quite a bit in the next few pages. The veil of unbelief between themselves and the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, they naturally got only the shadow of it. You know, imagine yourselves if you have a veil over, over your eyes. Well, the eclipse was today, right? And you put something over your eyes. Were you able to see everything else clearly? All the trees and the birds and so forth? No, you only saw that little bit of, of light because the rest was just dark. It was too dark to really let the light to see anything else. So when you put that veil of unbelief over our hearts, over our eyes, over our minds, then we are only going to see shadows, only shadows of what God is trying to teach you, teach us. They received only the shadow of the good things promised them instead of the very substance. Let us not note some of the shadows as compared with the realities. And the next section there, shadow and substance, that is what it's going to do in five points there is going to compare what they got by having that veil of unbelief over their their eyes and over their minds and what God the reality that God was trying to give them in some of the paragraph <clears throat> the the veil or the, the shadow is going to be spoken about first and then the reality in some of them the reality is the first thing that is mentioned and then the shadow that they got so I will kind of point it out just to make it a little easier I myself, I wrote next to to where the, um, the points are, whether it was the reality or the shadow, so I can just spot it easily. That's just an idea. <clears throat> Point number one, or comparison number one, shadow and reality. God has said, quote, if, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, end quote. But they never became a kingdom of priests. 
Only one tribe, and this is the shadow. Only one tribe, the tribe of Levi, remember? The ones that camped right around the sanctuary could have anything whatever to do with the sanctuary. And of that tribe, only one family, that of Aaron, could be priests. It was certain death for anyone not of the family of Aaron to presume to serve as priests in any way. Now here comes the reality of what God wanted for them, wants for us, and is still seeking to get out of us. Yet, all who are really the children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus, are a royal priesthood, even an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That comes from 1 Peter 2, 5. This was what God promised to the nation of the Jews at Sinai, but they never attained to it because they did not keep his covenant of faith, but trusted on their own strength. They went for working rather than faith and believing, right? Point number two, comparison number two. Here come, the reality comes first. Instead of being brought to the heavenly sanctuary, which God's hands established and being planted in it, here comes the shadow. They had a worldly sanctuary made by man and were not allowed to go into even that. Point number three. The reality comes first here too. The throne of God in the sanctuary above is a living throne, self-moving, coming and going like a flash of lightning, and in an immediate response to the thought of the Spirit. That is from Ezekiel 1. <clears throat> Let's go there. Ezekiel has a lot of symbols. And you're going to read some of those there in Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel is between Psalms and Daniel. Maybe that will help you. Psalms, Proverbs, Songs of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and then Ezekiel. All right, Ezekiel chapter 1. Just for a little description, we're only going to read verses 14 and 20. You're welcome to read the rest of it. it. It really takes a lot of concentration because it's, of course, things that we have not seen. We don't have an image in our minds already. Like when they say car, you already, in your mind, you picture what the essential parts of, this, of those are. But this here, we don't have an idea. But let's allow the spirit to stretch our minds, okay? Verse 14. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So think of beings that are just moving quickly like that, like a lightning of flash, of a, like a flash of lightning, I'm sorry. I'm thinking here maybe, maybe like how we see lightning bugs in the summer, how you see them passing and going just to compare to something that we know of, right? That we are acquainted with. And now verse 20. So here we have, there we have the mention of the flash of light. And now let's see about the spirit, verse 20. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheel. So the throne of God is, this is what this is, this is depicting there. The throne of God, that is the kind of movement of mobility that it has. And that is the reality, right? Let's go back to point number three. That is the reality. We just read a little bit of it in Ezekiel chapter one. Let's now go to the second part of point number three to see what the shadow that they got 
accustomed to and they got because they couldn't receive the reality. On the contrary, they had in the earthly sanctuary but a feeble representation of that throne in the shape of an ark of wood and gold, which had to be carried about on the shoulders of men. That box did not move by itself, did not have wheels, did not move like, like a flash of lightning for sure. So it was, it was a beautiful representation and it, it brought so many lessons, but it was a far, far shadow from the reality of, that God wanted for them. For us too, we say them, but we're talking about us too. Number four, again here, we'll find the, the, the reality first. The promise in the covenant with Abraham, which God's people were to keep, was that the law should be put where? In the heart. That is the reality of what God wanted to do, wants to do, and is waiting to be able to do in our hearts, right? To write his law in our hearts, that it will be automatic for us. All right, let's go now to the shadow. The children of Israel got it on tables of stone. Instead of faith, receiving the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, according to Romans 8, 2, that is upon the living stone in the midst of the throne of God, which would impart life to them, making them also living stones. What is it they received? They received the law only on cold, lifeless stones, which could give them nothing but death. Now, I want to make sure that we understand what this is saying there. It is not saying that the law is death, is it? It's not saying that the law is a problem. The law is not the problem in the same way that the face of Moses was not the problem. <laughs> Where was the problem? In the hearts and minds of the people. That is exactly what happened with the law too. Oh, we will do anything the Lord says. Right there. The poor law could not have gone anywhere, right? because they were not willing that the law could be in their hearts. Remember from Romans 7, 12, what it says about the law? This is from the last uh, seminar. It says, for the law is, for the command, no, for the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. And there it is on the, on the screen. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Nothing is wrong with the commandment. Those are promises, right? And God is waiting to be able to carry them out in us. All right, num point number five. In short, here comes the reality. Instead of the ministration of the righteousness of God in Christ, they got what? Here comes the shadow. Only the ministration of death. For the very same thing, which is a savor of life to them, pardon me, which is a savor of life to them that believe, is also what? A savor of death to them that do not believe. And a, a savor means flavor, or also it could mean an aroma or fragrance. Let's read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul speaks there about a savor of life unto life or a savor of death unto death. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read verses 14 to 16. Second Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Can anybody say amen? <laughs> yes, right? He always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. 
So he makes us to be that flavor that is carried to everyone, that perfume, that aroma that brings in a good sense, a good re a reception wherever we go. What else does it say? Verse 13. Pardon me, verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, in them and in them that perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Well, the answer would be, God, right? God is the only that is, is sufficient, and he makes us sufficient. That is what it meant in verse 14 when it says, he makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Notice how he says that we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. We are a sweet savor, but that sweet savor, it can be received by a person like going, oh, I hate that. And so what is supposed to be a sweet savor becomes to that person something that is offensive. Why? Because there's unbelief, because there is resistance, because they don't want it at all. But to them that receive it, that are looking for more, that are in a connection with the vine, oh, that is a savor of life unto life. That is what is meant in that point number five that we just read there in the book. All right. Now we go to the last paragraph in that section. But see the kindness of and mercy of God even in this. He offered them the bright shining of his glorious gospel. And they interposed a veil of unbelief. Here it is, that little phrase again. So that they could receive only the shadow. Please underline the next four lines. Yet that very shadow was an ever-present reminder of the substance. Why? When a thick passing cloud casts a shadow on the earth, we know, if we are not too dull to think, that it could not cast a shadow if it were not for the sun. So that even the cloud proclaims the presence of the sun. So we were just reading about that savor of life unto life. Even though the person might be so offended by what they see you do or hear you say or the way that you behave and they just want to get rid of you and they don't want to be in your presence, the very fact that they are being impacted that way tells that there is something in the life of that person that is bringing that reaction, right? Is exactly what happened with Jesus. Was Jesus ever cantankerous, judgmental, um, gross? No, gentle, sweet, kind, forgiving, all of that. But what did they do? Did everybody say, oh, come here, Jesus. Oh, we're so glad to see you. No, in the end, those that were just, oh my, they couldn't stand him. What did they do? Kill them. For what reason? Because they couldn't stand him, even though he was doing absolutely nothing that was wrong. Finishing now that paragraph, if therefore people nowadays, even profess Christians, were not as blind as the children of Israel ever were, they would be always rejoicing in the light of God's countenance, since even a cloud always proves the light to be present, and faith always causes the cloud to disappear or else sees in it the bow of promise, the rainbow, right? The light makes the colors appear. Next paragraph, next section, I mean, God's witness in unbelief. See, God didn't say, well, they don't want to see me, then oh, I give up on them. Let them die that way. No, then God goes to try something else, to try it another way, to bring another side of it, to make more light of it and make it, make it more appealing. So, it was better for the Jews to have the law even as a witness against them than not to have it at all. 
it was a great advantage to them in every way to have committed unto them the oracles of God. And oracles means prophecies, messages. That it comes from Romans 3, 2. It is better to have the law present to abrade us. Abrade means to scold, to rebuke. It is better to have the law do to us for our sins and to point out the way of righteousness than to be left entirely without it. So the Jews, even in their unbelief, had an advantage over the heathen because the Jews had the form, the picture of righteousness and, the tru and of the truth in the law. They might have not accepted it or believed it or appreciated it, but at least they had there a, a photo of it. What does righteousness look like? Romans 2.20. Please underline the next um, four, four lines, three lines. While that form could not save them, right? The law could not save them. If the law could save them, then what? Jesus would not have had to come, right? Good. While thus that form could not save them and only made their condemnation the greater if they rejected the instruction designed to be conveyed by it, yet it was an advantage in that it was a constant witness to them of God. God did not leave the heathen without witness in that he spoke to them of himself through the things that he had made, preaching the gospel to them in creation. But the witness which he gave to the Jews, besides the other, was the very image of his own eternal realities. And the very realities, realities themselves were for his people. Only the veil of unbelief over their hearts kept them from having the substance of which they had the shadow. But the veil is done away in Christ. And Christ was even then present with them. Let's read about that veil there. Second Corinthians, so you're already there, just into the next chapter. Chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 14 to 18. Let's read about that veil, which is done away with Christ. Verses 14 to 18. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even, again, unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. People keep saying, oh, no, 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 not the law. No, no, the, the law, it doesn't save. It doesn't this. We are under grace. We are not under the law, but under grace. And we keep trying to get rid of it. So it says, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Nevertheless, when it shall, be, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. What happens there? There is a conversion. That is what it means to convert, right? To be converted. You might have that veil. You might have that rebellion against it, that dislike of it, that unbelief. But the moment that you believe in Christ, everything starts to get just bright and clear and things that you never understood before. Now you see them in their beauty. And things that you thought were so repugnant, now they are your joy and pleasure. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then verse 18, look at it very closely. But we all, with open face, not with a veil, with open face, beholding as in a glass, a glass means a mirror. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So by looking at Him without unbelief, with open face, our 
characters change. Our mind is changed. We are transformed by his glory. From glory to glory, from character to character, from transformation to transformation. What a beautiful thing. Now, whenever the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil, veil shall be taken away. In other words, we believe there is a conversion experience. The veil is taken away. Even the blindest could see that the sanctuary of the old covenant and the ordinances of divine service that were connected with it were not the realities that God had sworn to give to Abraham and his seed. So they all might at once have turned to the Lord, even as individuals did throughout the whole history of Israel. I think our time is done now. We'll come back to that <clears throat> next time. And now um, I would like to, to tell you that verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3, that will be the next memory verse. You could believe, begin to, to learn it, but you remember next week we have a different session altogether. So let's kneel now for prayer. Heavenly Father, we have heard quite clearly what it means to have either belief or unbelief. It makes such a big difference, Lord. We realize, too, that our hearts and minds are so prone to going for the veil, for the shadow, for hiding away for resisting and rejecting. But Father, we pray that you will take that veil away from our hearts, away from the eyes of our minds, that we will be with open face, looking at you as though we were looking in a mirror, being transformed by keeping our eyes on you. That is what you want to do then everything else that before seemed to be a burden, a load, such a pain, now becomes a pleasure because we are in your presence and in your presence there, are, there is fullness of joy. Help us, Lord, that day by day we will have that conversion experience and that that veil will disappear and we will be able to stand before you and learn from you and day by day be transformed by your Holy Spirit that in the day that Jesus will return, we will be able to see him face to face. May that day come soon, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.